welcome. This is the final lecture in the Wilderness Issues Lecture Series, Journeys in Conservation. Can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, I'm Laura Young. I'm the director of the Wilderness Institute here at the University of Montana. And I'd like to start by I'd like to start by thanking a few key organizations and individuals who have contributed to this lecture series. First of all, the Dana Gallery for generously donating images for series promotional materials. Secondly, Missoula Community Access Television for filming all of the lectures. Those lectures will be showing on MCAT. Uh, they're actually uh, the first one shown and the second one will be shown later this week. If you'd like the schedule, you can go to the back of the room and you'll find it on our table. And finally, I'd like to thank Sarah Potenza of the Wilderness Institute, who did the bulk of organizing and promotional work for this series. Thank you, Sarah. And <laughs> our speaker tonight will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions and answers, discussion, until about 8.30. So please plan to stay until 8.30. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Chris Filardi, our final speaker for this series. Chris is a biodiversity scientist with the, for the Pacific programs at the American Museum of Natural History Center for Biodiversity and Conservation. Chris has a long history of conducting conservation and educational activities in wilderness around the world, as well as biodiversity research in the Pacific region. He has, among other things, studied the foraging behavior of palm cockatoos in Papua New Guinea in an effort to expand CITES protection, worked with the Wildlife Conservation Society to set up one of the first community-based wildlife reserves in Papua New Guinea, and studied radiations of Pacific birds to clarify boundaries among species and began unraveling the origins of pan-Pacific bird groups. Throughout his professional career, Chris has maintained a commitment to bridging his research interests with grassroots conservation practice. While not in Melanesia or in the tropical Pacific, he's established natural history-based undergraduate student programs that integrate indigenous communities with wildland conservations in threatened landscapes in Western North America and Central America. His current work for the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation includes initiating seabird research on Palmyra Atoll, working with the First Nations of British Columbia to aid in the conservation of temperate rainforests, and expanding his nearly 12 years of research and conservation work in the Solomon Islands into the first community-driven protected area network across the archipelago. Chris is a world-class scientist, a committed and passionate educator, an inspiring naturalist, and a tireless conservationist, which is a very unique combination. And as one of his friends, uh, mentioned just a few moments ago, he can quote poetry while catching a 50 pound fish on a fly line and get so dirty he fades into the background. So with that, please welcome Chris Filardi. Well, thanks to Lori and, uh, and Sarah, uh, Nikki Beer, everybody at the Wilderness Institute for, uh, for giving me the privilege to talk as part of this series. And, uh, oh, jeez. And, uh, wow. And, um, and, and thank you as well to the Wilderness Institute for, for hosting this series once again. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great gift to our community. So I thank you all. And I thank you guys for coming. So as, as the last speaker in this series, I thought I should start by saying a few words about wilderness. Now, for those of us of European descent in North America, which is probably most of us in this room, I think we have a, a very complex history with both the concept and the gathering of places that wilderness is. Um, during our early history on this continent, we feared the feverish swamps and the dark hollows that were wilderness. But over time, as these receded away, I think we saw pieces of ourselves recede away as well. And by the mid-1960s, our attitudes about wilderness had shifted enough that Lyndon Johnson signed the Wilderness Act. And the act coined that famously succinct and poetic definition of wilderness as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself or herself is a visitor who does not remain. But in the decades that followed, efforts to steward the richness of life on earth 
shifted in many ways away from this aesthetic or more, more poetic sense of value towards science. The diversity of life on Earth was vanishing at alarming rates. This was and is a crisis. And in recognition of that crisis, um, biodiversity, or the variety of life on Earth, and all the ecological processes which sustain it, became a, a sort of a guiding currency for conservation action. And this is the cover art from a book edited by Ed Wilson in 1988 entitled Biodiversity. And it was really the first major work on this topic. And it's something I use a lot with students to illustrate the concept of biodiversity. It's a wonderful image in that it captures the variety of both form and function in different species, but also occupying these different realms of the earth, from wet tropical forest into the deep sea. But it also captures the processes that sustain the variety of life on earth. Hydrologic cycles, water sustaining life on earth. But in the context of biological diversity and conservation, there's one thing that's really missing from here, um, and, and that is people. Humanity is part of the richness of biodiversity. And I think in our society, there, there's reason for this separation and for a wilderness untrammeled by people um, and uninhabited by them. But I believe there are other kinds of untrammeled places where people are wild and entangled within the diversity of life. And it was people who taught me um, that biodiversity conservation is all about conserving what we know. And wilderness is all about the unknown, mystery, and maybe even magic. And it was also people that showed me that my personal currency for conservation as both a scientist and a conservation practitioner wasn't science alone, but was really guided by this union between biodiversity and wilderness. And it was also people who taught me, despite my fears, to really ride the edge between the known and the unknowable in my professional life. But it wasn't just any people who taught me these things. For many years, I've had the privilege to be guided by the people of Melanesia, or the so-called dark islands, for the dense blanket of jungle that covers these islands relative to islands further out in the Pacific and Oceania. And in particular, I've been taught by and interacted with and been welcomed by people from New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. These are people who two decades ago, when I first met them, desperately wanted the beeping wristwatch I had on my wrist and didn't know how to tell time. So tonight, what I'd like to do is give you a sense of my exploration of some of these islands in time, these places out of step with our wristwatches, places untrammeled but lived in for 40,000 years or more. I'd also like to talk about what I've come to call accidental encounters with wilderness. Now, when I said accidental encounters with wilderness earlier to a friend of mine today who had been to the Solomons, he said, oh yeah, I had an accidental encounter with wilderness. Remember we were driving in that boat and that big flying fish whapped me in the face? You know that. But what I mean by accidental encounters with wilderness is that myself and my colleague and wife, Catherine, weren't looking for wilderness when we went into these places, nor were the indigenous Solomon Islanders who hosted and guided us. We were looking as scientists for biodiversity. Um, them for money, Definitely entertain it and entertainment. Watching my clumsy butt walking around in those forests was definitely entertaining for him. But we were also a lens into this other uh, unknown time that we come from. We weren't looking for wilderness, but we all found wilderness. And it was a wilderness that's defined more by unbroken human history with place than by places uninhabited, intact, but soiled by human history. And so tonight, I hope to take you on a brief journey into the Solomon Islands to recount some of our scientific expeditions into this place that resulted in these accidental encounters with wilderness that have really inspired a life's work. And I also must say that I just got back from the Solomon Islands, and uh, linear thinking is challenging. So please excuse me if, uh, if, uh, if this weaves around a little bit. I've got notes here, which I usually don't have. Um, but for those who are unfamiliar with the Solomon Islands, they lie just east of New Guinea, northeast of Australia, along the equator, and they're nearly a thousand islands that sprawl out across 1,200 kilometers of Pacific Ocean. There are seven major island groups in the chain. That top island up there, Bougainville, is actually politically part of Papua New Guinea, 
and the other six main island groups, Isabel, New Georgia, Choisel, Guadalcanal, Malaita, and Makira, are all politically part of the Solomon Islands nation, an independent nation. Now, as I said, the Solomon Islands lie in the heart of Melanesia. And as a Melanesian country, there are really two distinctions that pop into the mind of anybody who knows about Melanesia. And the first is the diversity of human cultures. There's about half a million people living in the Solomon Islands. They speak over 100 distinct languages. Some of these languages are as different as Chinese and German. Second, traditional systems of land tenure or ownership, which have been in place for tens of thousands of years, are recognized by law. This means that these half a million indigenous people living in the Solomons, using the resources there, actually have sovereign rights over access to those resources, over stewardship to those resources, and over the sort of um, commodification of those resources. But I got to be honest, I mean, I'm talking a lot about people here, but it wasn't people that first brought me to the Solomon Islands, or, or Melanesia for that matter. It was um, that mystery of mysteries. Where did life come from? How do species originate? And how has life on Earth diversified into all the variety we see today? And in this year of the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth, I think we've heard probably a lot about Darwin and really Wallace independently coming up with this grand idea about how species and life has diversified through time. And of course, this resulted in Darwin's um, incredible book that's still powerfully transformative to this day. Yet, despite providing an elegant explanation for how species change and diversify over time, this book on the origin of species wasn't really about origins at all. The question of exactly where and how new species form was largely left unanswered in this book on the origin of species. That is, until early genetic theory, unavailable to Darwin, met a young scientist named Ernst Meyer, recently returned from a far-flung archipelago called the Solomon Islands. And when Meyer, pictured here with one of his assistants in Indonesia in 1928, when he went to the Solomon Islands while participating on the Whitney South Seas expedition that was run through actually the museum that I work for now, um, what he encountered were some of the most remarkable patterns of biodiversity on Earth. And it was these patterns that ultimately led Ernst Meyer and his colleagues to answer Darwin's great unanswered question. And I've got to sort of pause here for a minute and just give you guys a tiny sense of the remarkable diversity of life that really has made the Solomons this sort of unsung hero of our understanding of the diversification of life on Earth our modern scientific understanding of Genesis. Now, when I say tropical Pacific, you look at these wispy coralline islets and atolls with the waving palms and all that, and that's what South Pacific conjures up. And the Solomons have that, but they're big and diverse. There are huge volcanic islands, tectonic islands. Some of the largest rivers in the tropical Pacific carve through these mountain ranges. Some of the largest inland lakes and swamps in the tropical Pacific flow through these places. And as diverse as these landscapes are, they're all blanketed in wet tropical forest. Along with New Guinea, the Solomon Islands lie in one of the three last great intact regions of wet tropical forest. Central Africa, the Amazon, and really the Solomons in New Guinea. And within these forests, these remarkable forests that are still intact to this day, are incredible patterns of diversity. Meyer encountered widespread forms when he was there. Dragonflies, things you guys recognize from here in Montana, or at least in North America. But as he encountered these things, each one was slightly different than organisms that he was familiar with in New Guinea. But it wasn't all that subtle. There were incredible things, like this organism here. This is the world's largest skink, Carusia zebrata, the prehensile-tailed skink. Now, skinks are normally, I mean, a whopping big one to be about the size, the body would be about the size of my pointer finger. And they run around on the ground and scuttle about. They're here in Western North America. They scuttle about eating insects, sometimes other lizards. Many of you have probably seen skinks. Um, this guy has this prehensile tail, wraps it around branches, hangs from the branches, grabs leaves and eats them. In the evolutionary experiment that is the Solomon Islands, 
time and place turned a little skink into a monkey. And it's only found in the Solomon Islands. So it's an incredibly inspiring place. However, the group of organisms that really inspired evolutionary biologists and that essentially created um, the muse for Meyer to alter our perceptions of, of the diversity of life forever were the birds. Of the nearly 200 species of birds resident to the Solomon Islands, nearly half of them are found there and nowhere else on Earth. Every image you're seeing here is of a bird that's found in the Solomons and nowhere else. But what was even more remarkable than all the birds Ernst Meyer encountered that were only from the Solomons was as he traveled from island to island along that chain, groups of birds like this thrush, this thrush, right, would be on all the islands. It's a thrush, but its color would be a little bit different. Its song would be different. And nowhere was this sort of more dramatic than in one of those main island groups of the Solomons, the New Georgia group here. So this is one of those seven main island groups. And as Ernst Meyer traveled around these island groups, he started encountering these little birds called white eyes, so-called for a ring of white feathers around their eye. And in these southern islands here, Colombanga, New Georgia, Rendova, Tetapari, three separate species of white eyes. This gap here is only two and a half kilometers. You could swim that if there weren't so many sharks. Um, on Renanga here, no more than 12 kilometers from its near, nearest neighbor island, a separate species. And another on Vela La Vela, again, 10, 15 kilometers away. And another in the high elevation forests of Colombangra. And then on the tiny island of Gizo, not much larger than the island of Manhattan, a full species bird found only there and nowhere else on Earth. This is arguably the, arguably the most restricted range songbird in the world. And when Meyer saw these patterns, he was deeply inspired. He had an epiphany. Darwin's great unanswered question, where do species come from? Meyer had a simple answer. Geographic isolation. Geographic isolation and the reproductive isolation that follows as genesis. And I'm not going to go into this here tonight. This isn't the heart of the talk. But um, this is an undertold story that is fairly dramatic. And it's really what attracted us to the Solomons. But Meyer used this group of birds as his poster child for this idea that geographic isolation and the reproductive isolation of genetic lines that followed is the origin of species. And he used that to define what a species is as essentially a reproductively isolated population of organisms. And birds of the Solomons were his poster child. Now, very much more recently, actually when I was working on my dissertation and my colleague and wife Catherine was as well, um, this work by Ernst Meyer and Jared Diamond culminated in a book that summarized their ideas, their answer to the origin of species. And at a lunch in the mid-1990s, Jared Diamond, sitting across the table from my wife and I in Seattle, um, echoed the sentiment of one of the most famous ornithologists back in the 1920s. And he wrote a letter to Ernst Meyer when he was shipping off to the Solomons. And he said, nowhere on earth is there a better place to study speciation in birds than the Solomon Islands. And Diamond said to us, you know, it's still true. 80 years later, it's still true. And you guys have something we didn't have, the ability to analyze DNA. So unlike Darwin and Meyer and Diamond, who could only look at patterns of diversity in space across geography, genetic analyses enabled us to gain a view back in time. So the history of evolutionary change among organisms leaves the equivalent of little footprints that can be traced back in time using laboratory techniques that analyze DNA. But to use and see this new natural history, essentially to create this, this time machine, we needed to get Solomon bird DNA from the Solomons back to big fancy laboratories in the US, which I actually have no idea how to use. This is all my wife who did this. Um, we couldn't do this in the field. We had to get blood back to the states. And, um, and to do that, we had the terrible task, generally in the cold winter months of Seattle, of traveling to the Solomon Islands. And somebody had to do it. But you know, these, these trips really resulted in some of the most remarkable experiences of my life. And it required working intimately with tribal leaders, with elders, and indigenous people intimate with these places 
because of customary land tenure. Um, and though it really took nearly a decade um, until I sort of stumbled on some kind of conservation practice that I thought could work in this context, and I'll talk about that in a minute, these intimate trips required by our early scientific work um, really enabled um, a path forward for conservation um, that is beginning to work. And there are many stories that I could tell to sort of illustrate how this happened. I'm going to tell one knowing that really I could tell stories of a number of different places um, and they would all be, be, be very much the, sa the same in terms of their message. But first we had to get around to these islands to collect, um, collect DNA. And traveling among the big islands of the Solomons required planes. On the few roads that are there, we had to hop in the back of tractors and hump along. We then took motor canoes and ran up and down the coast of these islands and punched into big river drainages as far as we could until outboard motors wouldn't work anymore. And we loaded all our stuff into dugout canoes and kept going up those rivers and dumped stuff on our back and kept walking in to the interiors of these islands many of the places which hadn't been visited by Western scientists since headhunters roamed these dark forests, and many, many other areas that had never been visited by Western scientists at all. It was really a dream for, for a young biologist, a happy accident, to be honest. It was not planned. Um, but once in those sites, we had to set up places to live, um, to work, to prepare these, these specimens, which would enable modern genetic analysis back at museums. Um, and, and enable us, in, our, in some small way, to carry on the work of Darwin and Meyer and Diamond. However, I'm not really going to talk about that tonight. What I really want to tell you about is our experiences in these forests as guests, where our hosts um, have been living in these forests for tens of thousands of years. And these were people who enabled us to travel in ways um, that we could have never achieved on, on our own. They, showed us where to go when we were lost or uncertain. Um, they really took care of me, even when I, um, apologies for the picture of myself, but there's often nowhere else, no one else with me, but even when I wrote in a grant proposal, I will map that route from the top of Makira down to the coast with my GPS and send you the file. And that's a deliverable in a grant, you know? I gotta do it. And they took care of me when I'm going across there and there's crocodiles all over the place. And I think the only reason my butt didn't get chewed is they had sticks and they really protected me actually. It was a ridiculous thing to do. Um, they guided us truly deep into their worlds and actually worked with us and added depth to our work. And importantly, for me as a naturalist and as a biologist, um, I became a much better naturalist working with these people. They're incredible naturalists. So in these local languages, most of those 100 languages in the Solomon Islands, if you look at the names for birds, for instance, they match our scientific names for birds almost identically. And where they don't match identically, there are places where Western science has trouble classifying what a species is. Um, so these are incredible naturalists, and they shared that knowledge freely and very willingly. They also shared great wisdom. Um, wisdom that came from a generational experience with place, but also through very carefully articulated stories that reflected that experience with place. And I'm going to talk to you about one place um, to illustrate this idea of these sort of accidental encounters with wilderness or wildness that really inspired meaningful conservation practice. And it's a story of birds and these camps up in mountains and kind of a spooky story um, and a bit of an expedition. But ultimately, on this island here, Colombangra, when we had to travel from the coastline up to these 800 meter um, elevation cloud forests that rim the crater, when we had to travel up there, many of the locals who were going to take us there actually hadn't traveled the routes that we were going to go up. However, their ancestors had. And it was described in detail in story. And it was these stories as much as anything that we followed into these places. Um, and it was a bit like walking into a poem. As you ascend these forests, you go from these torrid, I mean sweltering, hot, you know, your toenails are rotting off, lowland forest. And you climb up through areas where the smells of these myrtles, it starts smelling like eastern Oregon in June, you know, up in those coastal forests there. And then you rise above that into this sort of 
high epiphytic ridgeline kind of area, and then finally up into these elfin moss enshrouded cloud forests, um, which really are home to some of the most remarkable organisms that I've ever encountered in my life. And many of them, like these two here, they don't have names yet. Um, one of the frogs we found, I thought this was a little froglet and we found several of them and I was wondering why there weren't lots of them. Well, this actually is an adult female frog. That coin here is not much larger than a quarter. So this adult female frog full of eggs, you could see the eggs inside of her, basically fits on George Washington's face on a quarter. Um, incredible. So, you know, suffice it to say with respect to science, we really encountered everything we could have dreamed of. The birds were incredible with several confined just into the crater of the forest within the crater of that island alone and nowhere else on Earth. We got glimpses and now we're almost sure there's an endemic form breeding up in the crater walls of the peregrine falcon. Um, that's phenomenal, peregrine falcon, you know? Um, totally looks different, it's hooded. Its whole head is hooded. Spectacular bird um, and so much more, but again, what I really want to focus on tonight are really the physical manifestations of customary stories of place that have ultimately guided our conservation practice here. These are three stages of a giant longhorn beetle. This is one of the largest insects in the world. I guess it depends on how you measure them, you know. If you measure those horns, it's a whopper. But its body, its body's pretty big. Um, but in story, these three stages are thought to represent three tribal lines that were born of the original people of Duque, Colombangra, this island, the water king. And this older man, when we got up to our camp, he just quietly, he took off. He just disappeared, quietly padding about. And these people never wear shoes. Their feet are like hands, just gripping, walking through the forest. And I'm sure um, native peoples here used to do that all the time as well. It's fairly phenomenal how quietly they can move through the forest, um, especially compared to me. <laughs> um, but uh, he went around and gathered these three stages of the beetle. And, um, and he sat down, and he and another older man in this sing-songy, sort of seemingly unrehearsed call and response, retold the story of these three lines and of Duque that the younger folks had heard probably 20, 30, 40, 50 times, but they had never seen those three stages of this bug together in the hands of an elder as the story was told, holding history as it should be and some of these tough young guys, I mean, bulletproof young guys, start tearing up, you know, they start sitting there. It was incredibly moving for them. Um, but really one of the most significant stories in terms of this place um, that really affected me and helped me understand um, what these folks were encountering while I was encountering this really scientific and, and wilderness Shangri-La um, is about a spirit woman uh, named Lockie. This guy told us the story, but I had first heard it actually from his mother, um, who lived to a very old age in the Solomons. And apparently this woman, Lockie, was born, came to Col Columbanger for marriage um, from another island in the Solomons um, called Choisel Island. She lived on the island when missionaries first got there in the late 19th century. And, um, and when missionaries got to these places, it drew people down from the interiors of these islands to head down along the coasts Sure, they kind of believed in God, but mostly because they could get metal and medicine and stuff from the missionaries. And they came down, we'll believe in God, give us a machete and some, you know, whatever, some aspirin, and we'll believe in anything. <laughs> so they came down along the coasts and, um, and, and left these places really that they had inhabited out of fear of headhunters who used to roam the coasts. So Lockie comes to Colombanger at that time, apparently from Choisel, this other island, marries in, and um, things went bad for Lockie on Colombanger. I don't think she liked her husband. She took off to go home, and nobody recognized her at her home. So she got sent back to Colombanger. When she went back to Colombanger, they said, you're out of here. You left us, you're out of here. Now, it's interesting, Colombanger is matrilineal, right? It's a matrilineal set of societies, so this story has some resonance, eh? You know, fine to think globally, but marry locally. Um, but anyway, she came back, they kicked her up into the mountains of Colombangra, and when she was rejected, apparently she went high in these forests to these old cloisters and reconnected with the spirits 
of those old three lines of Duque. And she lived in these cloisters where the elders used to live. So these are hanging valleys way up inside the crater of Colombangra. And she lived up in there with them. And they used to live there because they were frightened of headhunters, as I said. And they'd have these conch, they'd blow conches up and down the ridge line from these cloisters to pass information to their elder spokespeople um, about whether headhunters were coming, um, whether they needed to move, or such and such. But anyway, the stories surrounding this Lockie, this spirit woman, describe these places and how to get to them in great detail. In great detail. And what's interesting is Lockie is said to sort of move about on these cold mountain ridges, mountain winds up and down the ridges. Um, you see her in, in, in deep valleys. Um, in your dreams, she's got this white hair, a mossy, lichen-entangled face. And if you come into those places that are described in the stories without welcome, um, without doing proper custom, you might wake up high in a tree somewhere three days after some really important feast, two days after you're supposed to get married, something like that. Lockie does stuff like that. She won't hurt you, but she'll really mess with you. Well, one day we're sitting, this was our view from our camp, we're sitting looking down on this calm ocean, and this is at about 1,200 meters. Um, and the local team in our camp suggested they wanted to follow the stories of really their grandmother um, to these special places that were described in, in, in her stories. So I gave them a couple of days off from our research work to, to sort of follow these storied routes up into the places. And I decided not to go with them, I said, out of respect for their culture. They said because I was scared but uh, I'm sticking with my story. So they went and came back amazed, but they were scared actually too. But uh, when they walked through these cavern-like trails and followed the trails, um, they had found places exactly as described in these stories. They found stone stairways etched into the sides of these steep valleys that were clean and looked like they had just been walked. They found these terraced tarot gardens with springs coming out of the walls of the mountains and tarot this ancient root crop. And the kinds of tarot that were in these tarot gardens were thought to have gone extinct. These forms or cultivars of tarot were thought to have gone extinct and were still growing as if tended in these little terraces. And the walls and foundations of the ancient elders' homes were still there, waiting for a new leaf house to be built on top of them. Um, when they approached up there, this big wind blew. And they heard voices in the old language, they said. You know, no English in there, no pigeony stuff. You know, no, you know, there's a lot of English words now that seeps in. But no, this was the old thing. And they took off back to camp. And some of them, as black as they are, man, they were looking kind of white to me. Um, that night, nobody slept, including myself, I have to say, as skeptical as I was. Um, and many in their dreams, including me, to be honest, saw this white-haired, mossy-faced woman gliding around camp and doing all this stuff. And this place is littered with artifacts. I, someone was asking me about headhunters before the talk, and I actually decided not to take pictures of, of a lot of the stuff in there, honestly out of respect. Um, Maybe out of a little fear, though, actually, too, of capturing those images. But there are all these strange blade-like stones which don't occur anywhere on this volcanic island. These are from a te tectonic islands, and they're, they're up in the bush there, everywhere. This is a shrine from another place that I visited. This is a picture I took off the web. This is a tourist shrine. It's a real one, but a lot of tourists visit it. But there were shrines far more elaborate than this, dappling the whole interior of this crater. And, and I could go on and on. There was more. This, two, this is a wall. It's probably nipple high on me. And it was 200 meters long, sitting exactly where and exactly how it was described in these old stories, still intact after earthquakes, a couple of centuries of tropical forest history. Um, all of this had a profound influence on these Solomon guys I was with, on, on me as well. And it really revealed a path forward for conservation in the face of this challenge, which is customary land tenure. And, and, I, and I want to get to that now. But really what's remarkable is that these places with these stories exist all across the Solomons. Everywhere you go, every big wild place you get into has stories like this, has artifacts like this, has history like this. The, the leaf men of, of Guadalcanal, the great bird people of Choisel, this race of powerful dwarfs who put river stones in their armpits and they walk around all the time like this. 
the Kakamora, these powerful hobbit people um, of Makira, you should have seen how excited they were when they found that hobbit over in Indonesia. That skeleton, they said, Kakamora, they are real. Um, but this, this stuff exists across the Solomons. And I want to emphasize that from the perspective of the people that took us into these places, through physically following these stories that they had heard all their lives, they really discovered things that echoed with the same thing, I believe, that wilderness or wildness, wildness does to us. But it was much richer in some ways and had a more specific rhetoric of place. At first, I was only guided by stories of biology and wildness. In time, it got much deeper, and the sense of place and meaning that those people shared with me really became, became my guide. Now, clearly, biology is significant in these places, as is the wildness in our sense of wildness. I don't want to discount that. Um, but in the Solomons, I came to see that the real currency for conservation is biology, but it's also custom, what I learned as custom. Now, that's not a misspelling, K-A-S-T-O-M, not like country kitchen, but that's really how you spell it. And custom is more of a concept than a word. Um, it describes human interaction and behavior as within what we would call biodiversity. And in the Solomons, it's biology and custom stitched together um, that really is what co that, 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 that conservation, that, that's essentially the currency for conservation in this place. And when we think about bridging my scientific perspectives, these metaphysical experiences you have with place, with the desire to conserve these places, it's, it's imperative, it's imperative that one blends, even in our minds, custom and biology. These things are one in the Solomons and are likely one everywhere. It's just often very difficult to see. And history sometimes makes it complicated to actually act on that. Here, I think there's still a great opportunity, but there's also threat. Um, the opportunity is that when we think about biology and custom intermingled, when we think about customary land tenure, indigenous people in the Solomon still having ownership over well over 95% of those landscapes. So the resource users are the resource owners. There's great opportunity there, but there's also great threat. And that threat um, lies in the legal system and the colonial history of the Solomons. Now, when the British, it used to be a British colony, colony until 1978, when the Brits got guilted, like many others, out of, out of having these colonies, um, they did set up a customary land court. And to the credit of the British colonial administration, they left land tenure in the hands of the indigenous people. And the customary land court recognizes communal rights of access and use, of ownership over the land. Now, I must say that I have yet to encounter an indigenous Solomon Islands language that has a word for ownership that relates to the land. It's all about use and bar borrow and steward. Um, but the customary land court recognizes communal ownership. And I want to read a very short piece by Gideon Zolovecki, a senior Solomon Island statesman who, who passed um, a couple of years ago. But he, he, he encapsulates what, what customary land tenure is. And that is, traditionally, land belongs to people and not to institutions like government, churches, companies, or councils. A person's right to use land comes from his membership of a line, tribe, or clan that is descended from the first people. The names of these first Solomon Islanders are inherited by the elders and chiefs among their descendants. The names of the tribes and the authority they gave were passed from generation to generation through word of mouth, illustrated by actions and symbols from elders to youngsters. In this way, members of the same tribe know their land rights with simplicity and without confusion. And that is true. Just about everybody knows the communal side of land tenure. And the customary land court recognizes that. However, when the Brits started getting out of Dodge, um, they realized that you need to, there are commodities in these forests that we want and other people are going to want, and there's an economy here. And there are these regulatory acts of parliament that are administered through the high court that say individuals have rights to buy and sell stuff on the land. It basically separated trees and rocks from the land. And this is a deep contradiction that has rippled through Solomon Islands culture. Now, these are people that still live in incredibly remote villages. 
Over 84% of Solomon Islanders have subsistence livelihoods where all of their basic needs are satisfied without cash, from the sea, from the bush, from gardens, etc. But this also means there's 84% of Solomon Islanders who really don't have cash. And now school fees, access to high quality medical care, and other services that require cash are very difficult for these people to access. And generally, there's incredible pressure on these um, remote communities, this 84% of Solomon Islanders, to liquidate their raw natural resources to gain cash. Now, by and large, industry has ruthlessly exploited this contradiction in Solomon Islands law. The fact that even though land ownership is really communal, if you get a few people to sign a piece of paper, you can actually get access to timber. And what happens is there are a few people who don't live, who are living in the capital of Honiara, who live away from these landscapes like Kolombangra, who meet some of these timber industry representatives. And um, with a big brown paper bag full of cash, access to some prostitutes and beer, and I hate to be so blunt about it, but this is what happens time and again. A few individuals get those benefits. They get paid thousands of dollars to, to sign a piece of paper. The logging company comes in, starts mowing down trees, slamming in roads, and before the communities living there can get through the customary land court to stop the logging, they're done. They get slapped with a fine that's essentially part of their operating budget, and, and they're gone. And these communities are essentially thousands of people. Half a dozen people get a few benefits that get frittered away on beer and women really quickly. And thousands of people are left with broken promises for new schools, medical clinics, clinics they're drinking silted water, they're fighting over firewood, and really fighting with each other. I don't want to say any more about that. Because the Solomon Islands, um, relative to most places, has a great deal of hope. There are huge, really the hugest, last intact forests within the tropical Pacific are in the Solomons. And there are indigenous people who have customary control over these landscapes, and they're looking for meaningful alternatives to this destructive history with logging. And this is where that idea of biology and custom, this idea that these people sensed what we would call wildness in these places and started valuing them in ways um, that I think had almost been forgotten. Or at least they didn't recognize that people from our side of the block would value those places and their history with those places as much as we might value timber, for instance. And the idea we came up with to try to sort of nurture conservation of these big places in the face of real challenges um, is really simple, to be honest. And we call these things community conservation agreements. And they're just basically transparent partnerships with communities where we simply say, our organization, we have a nonprofit in the Solomons right now, is going to come, we're going to define an agreement with you guys that provides partnership, where we're going to help you with the economic and social challenges that force you to choose, against your will often, unsustainable logging, so long as you provide some conservation outcome. We'll sort of help broker that deal. And the conservation outcomes could be protecting leatherback turtles that are preyed upon by humans for food, or it could be, um, placing large tracts of wet tropical forest off the chopping block um, to commercial logging and the digging zone for mining. Um, and you know, when I first presented this idea, after 10 years of duffing around in the Solomons, that we just want to have a partnership, guys, and we'll try to help you with your challenges, and you just tell us how, to, how you can kind of give us something we want. This one guy got visibly, verbally angry with me, which is so rare in the Solomons, and said, why didn't you think of this 10 years ago? Um, and it sounds simple. It's, it's a little bit like evolution by natural sel selection. It's, it's simple. Um, it's a simple idea, but really no one, no one had tried this, these transparent partnerships with communities. And just in short, I don't want to belabor this, but as I said, these are partnerships that divine benefits, and they're really trying to link development with biological wealth and sustaining cultural identity. And as sad as it sounds, the big international donor agencies that are in the Solomons and probably elsewhere have had a lot of trouble not seeing development as cons and conservation as conflict and, and sort of two sides of a coin as opposed to really essentially the same thing. Um, and then lastly, and what I learned most from these sort of accidental encounters with wildness um, with these local forest people is that 
there's a huge need to rely on traditional decision making within these communities. These community conservation agreements are born out of lots of time within these communities, interacting with people at all levels within the communities, trying to find authentic tr traditional decision making processes that can essentially broker an agreement where they tell us how to assist. Um, and it takes a lot of time. But in some places where people want this and people, where people really want to gain hold of their communal rights to access and use of their landscapes, it's starting to work. And on Colombangra, this green area in the middle is now the largest protected area in the Solomon Islands. And I didn't create this protected area. Um, a community conservation agreement between the charitable trust we started in the Solomons and a local traditional decision-making organization, they brokered this deal and have committed to it. And it includes 35,000 hectares of a 60,000 hectare island, over half the island, and these beautiful sort of reef to ridgeline strips you see, these tongues here going right up from the reef to up into these cloud forests are protected. And people are committed to it. If they decide they want logging, logging can come. Um, but for now, these places are, are sort of off the chopping block. And Colombangra is one of a whole set of areas that are now using these community conservation agreements to establish protected areas across the Solomon Islands. And we're also beginning to partner with other organizations who are seeing this approach as meaningful for them. The Nature Conservancy, the World Wildlife Fund are all partnering with us in, in some other areas. And each one of these areas now, finally, um, is being recognized by the government and it being gazetted as protected areas. And they're not gazetted like Yellowstone Park is gazetted or Glacier National Park or the Bob Marshall Wilderness. They're not just lines on a map. Um, what's gazetted is the government's backstopping and respect for the community conservation agreement, which are really oral decisions made within place by community members saying, this is how we want to manage our lands and we don't want commercial logging in here. And the government's starting to respect that. So to, to finish here, talking about government, one of the things that was really born out of these experiences we had with place is that good governance on all scales is critical. And, and this just gets to this idea of authenticity. Without some kind of authentic, um, community-driven decision-making process, Conservation in a place like the Solomons where indigenous people really truly have control over the land um, really um, is going to be very difficult. But more importantly, I think what our early scientific work engendered um, and really taught me was to trust human relationships with place in guiding my actions there. Um, and this trust and this partnership goes beyond just, just me and them. More importantly, it's across different sectors of Solomon Island society. And ultimately, it's about trust and partnership really across cultures. You know, Solomon Islanders tend to take a generational perspective on this kind of thing. You know, you find a way to conserve things of value um, through the next generation and hope that by that generation, living with the benefits of something like a CCA, and more so interacting with these places, that they'll be able to come up with solutions to all the unforeseen issues of the future that nothing we do right now is going to be able to, to deal with. And that generational perspective has been really powerful. And the hope, additionally, is that um, by, by entangling people and place in actual biodiversity conservation, in wilderness-style conservation, these are wildernesses by any definition of the word, by entangling those things, the hope is also that globally, People living in those places um, can really be a source of wisdom and strength, not just for Solomon Islanders, but for all of us, for all, all humanity, both now and into the future. And as I said, what we've done is really simply to assist local people that have been trapped by global forces of change. And most of this work has been done through traditional channels, and I've really more been just a, a shepherd more than anything. Um, and in the end, what has worked, I would argue, is guided more um, by poetry um, and that kind of aesthetic than by science. And uh, you know, it makes me think about a lot of the, I mean, Missoula is an amazing place. It makes me think about all the 
all the voices that we have here in, in Missoula. David Duncan, with so few words, adding so much to the pull and sweep of casting a fly. Joy Harjo, showing us a blackbird within a universe of blackbirds and, and, and helping us remember the dance that language is, that life is. Terry Williams, who was recently here, making us all blush with the recognition of sort of that eroticism of walking barefoot on moist earth. Um, Jim Harrison, teaching us to assume the stance of a pebble in a stream. And then Gary Snyder, you know, gently pushing us, know the plants. All those poets and others that have and will come, I think broadly defined, there's also a poetry of place. And this is what really resulted in these encounters with wild places in the Solomons that I've described tonight. They're really what guided my personal responses to them in terms of opening myself up to just trusting local people to guide conservation. And, um, and I just want to end with a poem that I think really resonates with, uh, with what, I try, what I've tried to get at tonight and, uh, and leave it at that. And I apologize, you know, there's a lot of he and himself and man, but this poem was written in 1938 by Robinson Jeffers, and I hope you can see through the he, him, man thing. But it's called The Answer. Then what is the answer? Not to be deluded by dreams. To know that great civilizations have broken down into violence and their tyrants come many times before. When open violence appears, to avoid it with honor or choose the least ugly faction. These evils are essential. To keep one's own integrity, be merciful and uncorrupted and not wish for evil and not be duped by dreams of universal justice or happiness. These dreams will not be fulfilled. To know this and know that however ugly the parts appear, the whole remains beautiful. A severed hand is an ugly thing. And man disserved from the earth and stars and his history often appears atrociously ugly. Integrity is wholeness. The greatest beauty is organic wholeness the wholeness of life and things, the divine beauty of the universe. Love that, not man apart from that. Thank you so much for, uh, for listening. So I guess I'd be happy to answer questions if people have any. So a lot of the a lot of the developments are defined by the communities themselves. So for, for these people to, for, for instance, to organize and um, and improve health care on an island that really has very poor access to health care, it's it's incredibly difficult for them to organize that. So through our organization, what we've been doing is through these community conservation agreements is simply help link them to international donor agencies that provide funding and expertise in that. Um, a lot of what we provided directly are things like scholarship programs where we're paying um, community members school fees for them. So these are communities that really have no cash unless they cut trees down. And um, so what we've done is sort of pay their, pay their school fees and then what little cash they have doesn't immediately go out to school fees. Um, but most of the development stuff is sort of brokering link linkages between these remote communities who really have no access to opportunity and, um, and these opportunities that exist, you know, through, for instance, USAID, um, United Nations Development Program, uh, AusAid, things like that. But the, 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 the actual development projects themselves are sort of up to the community. Some of them are sort of dr seaweed drying programs, things like that, where they want to market dried seaweed and, and, and sort of have difficulty putting together how to access those markets, how much to produce at a given time, that kind of stuff. I was wondering if you could discuss what these headhunters are. Uh, people are very familiar with what you're talking about. Um, these are people who traveled around in the Solomons. You know, they, there's a long history of, of human beings killing other human beings in this part of the world for uh, um, sort of a ritualized killing, but some of it was actually um, sort of tit for tat kind of stuff. Um, you know, you, you put some bad medicine in our place, we're going to come over and kill you. And they were called headhunters because often they took people's heads. <laughs> 
a little bit like scalping here where you'd kill somebody and take a piece and hang it off the side of your horse here. Um, there it was taking these heads back to these um, areas where men would gather and tell stories about their, their rampages. And headhunting really reached a peak about 400 and well, 350 to 400 years ago when people just start, a few of the coastal people started getting metal and could really overpower the people who were living in the interiors of these islands. Um, and, and that's when really they, they, they retreated up into these cloisters and left their coastal villages until missionaries came in and sort of changed that dynamic. A uh, previous speaker that we had here talked about uh, Madoc and uh, the problems with people there and how tourism is actually a uh, uh, bane to their existence. Uh, in the Solomons, is tourism a boon or a bane to them? Um, tourism is not as big of a thing just because it's a place is so remote, but uh, it's... Um, Would it be away from them? There are some places that are... That are tourism is difficult because it, it's quite fickle. Um, if you start relying on tourism and set yourself up for tourism, as soon as there's any political strife or the economy goes downhill, tourism just turns off and it can leave people high and dry um, with a fairly specialized set of skills and industry. We're, there's a, a little bit of tourism going on, but trying to keep that to a minimum because there are some real um, cultural impacts of tourism as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a huge sort of international discussion right now about tourism and, and indigenous people. Um, in the Solomons, it hasn't been as a big a problem because uh, there's really not, um, not that many people that come there. I think last year there were about 2,000 tourists that visited the Solomons, and that includes cruise, cruise ships where the people hardly get off. Um. Um. I was wondering in the last decade or so, have you seen any signs of climate change? And if so, what, are the, what have been the effects? And then if not, do you think it will affect the islands and the people in the future? Um, yeah, I think there have been pretty dramatic effects um, in the Solomon Islands. It's a little bit hard to say in that um, the places that get most affected um, you know, early in this climate change scenario that we're dealing with um, are these low-lying islands in the lagoons. But what's interesting is many of those islands are basically built out of sand. And sand is made by big fish that munch algae and coral and grind it up with these raspers and poop it out. So there are these sand-making engines, these huge fish, and there are herds of them. They're like big grazers. And they've been hammered. Um, those fisheries have been hammered by people spearfishing with scuba tanks to sell them. Um, primarily to markets in Asia. So a little of it, I think, uh, is actually the engines that have generated these islands, these big you know, coral foraging fish have disappeared, and that's creating collapses in the coral due to algal blooms, and sand itself is becoming more scarce. So whether sea level's going up or just the islands are disappearing, it's very hard to tell. Um, but clearly there have been some impacts, there's been some apparent sea level rise and, and it's impacting low level, low lying villages. Um, that's probably the most significant impact there is, is sea level rise. Um, and there are whole communities that are going to have to, that are going to have to move. And probably the biggest impact here, and I would argue for Southeast Asia and, and, and parts further to the west, uh, are going to be these huge transmigrations of, of coastal peoples as, as sea levels do rise and as um, rain and, and, and water regimes change and force people to start moving, there's going to be huge conflicts associated with that. But so far, the Solomons have really avoided that. Way in the back. You, yeah. Uh, how are people organizing, this is kind of a complex question, I guess. How are people organizing themselves to ensure that um, in spite of all the linguistic differences, in spite of the, the different tribal differences and things like that, that's a good question. As I said, our plan is sort of generational. We're thinking in, in sort of 10, 10 to 20 year time frames. And these community conservation agreements are specific to, to tribes, to lineages of people who are very intimate with one another. So it's a good question in that I think if you try to do this across these different lineages and language groups, I think it would be impossible. That's one of the difficulties of the Solomon Islands as a nation, is that it's this 
hodgepodge of all these different language groups and islands sort of artificially stuffed together under one country. Um, but in terms of the future, what we're trying to do is, is get funding that's partially endowed and, uh, and essentially create funds that are available to um, these communities in partnership with us um, to, again, address these economic and social challenges that have driven these communities to, to choose, um, well, choose logging. That, that's sort of a, loosely use the word choose, um, because in the, for the most part, these communities don't want that. But they do need cash. So part of it's just sort of trying to create financing that's sustainable in that 10 to 20 year time range, which is challenging, but we're starting to make progress. But these are lineage specific agreements and the, the time scales tend to 10 to 20 years and, and that's how people are thinking about it. I was curious on your slide of the conservation area on Kohanga. Um, there appear to be some very small spots within that area that form green. Were those just village sites? Or? Um, yeah, within the green area, it's pretty contiguous. Um, but uh, around the whole bottom of the island, all the people are in a ring around the bottom of, of that island. Um, and uh, I could probably just pull it up, eh? <coughs> so yeah, all the people, there's this, th those, are, those are elevations, sorry. Those are all just elevations in little white that are up in there. Yeah, I didn't see that, that's a good question. Yeah, no, there's nothing up in there. Um, How does Guadalcanal look after World War II compared to some of these other islands that you remember? There's a small area on the north coast that's uh, where the capital is, um, but Guadalcanal's amazing. There's, uh, I mean, most of it's never been visited by, um, you know, Western people, white people, European descent people, um, and um, yeah, it's hugely intact. That big, that image of those rolling hills and forests is on Guadalcanal, and that's part of the largest um, intact forested area in the whole tropical Pacific. Um, but you see foxholes and all kinds of crazy stuff on Guadalcanal. These hospitals the Japanese dug into the side of mountains. It's, it's cool. Yeah? Um, question. We found two an unknown species. How are you going to name them? The reason why I'm asking is that back in either late August or early September, of Alan set of islands down in the south uh, by the Cuba area. They found the world's largest small snake and the scientists turned around and named that snake after the one. Yeah. But not the, uh, the people that so it wasn't for the natives there. They yeah. wouldn't have found it. But found that. Yeah, and so in terms of naming species, I'm, I'm pretty against naming them after people. Um, you know, people don't live very long, and places do. I was just asking because, you know, you found these two species within the island. Yeah. Are these, you know? what, what most, mostly what people want to name them after, actually one of them, there, someone in our camp suggested that that little frog be called Lachii, after that spirit woman. Um, so... It's, it's not, ultimately it's not my decision, but it'll, it'll be a place name. It'll be a place name, not a person's name. Roughly how many of those uh, conservation, uh, community conservation agreements are in existence right now? In the Solomons, uh, right now, um, we basically have uh, six that are in, in, in that are they're, but they're in various um, stages of maturity, from pretty new to very, very well developed. One of, one of the areas is on Tetapari Island, which is the largest uninhabited island in the tropical Pacific. It was left during these headhunting days and a mysterious disease, completely untouched. And that is, uh, we've been working on that conservation agreement for about eight years. And that's very mature. Kolombanga is also pretty mature. Um, but there are others that are just in their early stages where still building consensus, still kind of going through these public hearing processes where people can orally say yes or no. You know, these agreements are pieces of paper for the government, but for these people, those, those pieces of paper just represent the oral agreement that is, that is the contract. Um. Okay, um, 
Does shifting cultivation play um, into the island's culture today? Yeah, it's, it's not as, uh, as intense right now as it is in other parts of the world in there, in, in, in this place, and the, the soils are very, very rich. Um, but that is an issue, and right now, most of these protected areas are, allow shifting cultivation in some or part of the protected areas, but because population densities right now are so low, it's not really an issue. But again, that's really something in generations to come that people are gonna have to deal with. Um, and the, the challenges were so great to getting anything done in the Solomon Islands, given customary land tenure and its complexity, um, that um, these agreements right now are very, very simple in terms of what is stipulated in the agreements. But agriculture and gardens are, uh, you know, as human population densities increase, are going to become a really, really important issue that will have to be dealt with. Um, but right now, it's not as big of a problem as it is in many other areas because of the low population densities of people. Yeah? What characteristics differentiated the different species of the new Georgia bird? And is there enough genetic information to like, is there like a genetic tree that you're able to trace the one back to the common ancestor that was from years ago? Or? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting when we started first started doing genetic research on that group of birds, the little white eyes in the New Georgia group. We thought that was all going to be one little radiation. And when the data started coming in, we realized there were birds from Africa. These little white-eyed birds from Africa started popping up in there, from Australia. And it, this whole radiation across the entire Old World tropics out into Oceania was basically had evolved on the same scale as that tight little group of birds within those little 10-kilometer gaps of the New Georgia group. And we just published this actually um, about a month ago. And these are the, it's, it's the fastest evolving bird ever recorded. And it, the only other radiation that's faster, meaning the only other set of speciation events that we know of that happened faster are these little cichlid fishes in these uh, lakes in the Rift Valley of Africa. So an incredible story, not really what Meyer thought was happening there. Right? Meyer thought those guys were all their closest, each one's closest relatives. His idea about geography and reproductive isolation generating new species was right on. I mean, that's been corroborated again and again and again. And it's more complex than that, but that basic idea is spot on. Um, but those birds are wildly complex, and they're real. The they're, they're sort of, you know, the cliff notes to that story are they evolve faster than any other bird we've, we've um, studied in that way to date. And actually, while they were evolving that fast, ended up being able to spread across basically an entire hemisphere. Um. So how, how fast? Um, what do you mean? A hundred species um, came into being over a hemisphere in about two million years. Um, and that's just about the fastest we've ever recorded. But what we don't know is they could have all burst out about 250,000 years ago, or they could have all burst out a million years ago. That kind of stuff is difficult. These we're not, you know, we don't know how to interpret that kind of DNA data with that much specificity, but pretty much it's on the order of a couple million years and you got about 100 species. Is there any relationship between the diversity of languages spoken, the very geographic distribution, and the species distribution of birds or other species? Huge. Really cool. So in, in that New Georgia group, there's that island Vela La Vela. And for birds and language, it is a completely bizarre place. And I'm just going to get you up to it here so you can remember it. But um, this island here, this red island right here, for birds, that bird, the little Vela La Vela bird, is related to a whole other group of birds. And people's languages there are related to a whole other set of language groups relative to even Renanga or Gizo or Kolumbangra. So those patterns are amazingly concordant. Um, and uh, I mean, I've thought about it a little. I don't know exactly how to explain it, but it's, it's pretty amazing and cool. Did you have a question up there? I guess I'm curious about what you just presented us about how uh, 
how relatively, I mean, not, I guess relatively short period of time, but it's pretty long uh, for us, period of time it took for those many pieces to develop. Getting that kind of information out to a larger audience seems to me to be the kind of thing that would uh, help people understand the gravity of the rapid rate of species loss going on right now. Uh, and is there any thought of, I mean, I had no clue how long it took to for species to uh, evolve like that. And, and you say that this is the best just for people. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. And it seems like the kind of information that uh, would make someone stop and think for a moment. Um, I'm wondering if there are any efforts you know, to get that kind of information out of the world more than what's going on right now. Yeah, no, there, there, there are a lot of efforts. I think we sort of suffer from information overload. Um, if you were to go on the web and plug in white eyes or plug in fast speciation or something like that, a whole slew of websites would pop up talking about that research. Um, but it's really challenging to compete in sort of the, with the media engine right now to get messages like that out and have people cover them. Um, it's very challenging. Um, but, you know, we've, we've tried to bang the drum about that a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, and there, and there appears to be some effort now um, in the current administration here in the U.S. To, to start getting better about communicating that kind of scientific information to the general public. Um, but to be honest, there's, you, know, you try to get it out, and often it's been, it's been very difficult. Um, and part of that is just there's so much information out there that I think it's difficult to get it out to specific, to specific audiences. Um, but I would argue that... You guys here at University of Montana, every course in ecology and evolution um, should provide a really good sense of basically what we know about what a species is, about how long they live, what it takes to invent a new species. I mean, we don't have great answers to all that stuff, but we have pretty good answers to that stuff. And, and there are great ongoing discussions that relate to that stuff. Um, and at least in my education, I didn't receive that as an undergraduate. And, um, and I've tried hard in, in my teaching to try to provide that to people, but um, it's challenging. There's so much information out there now to cover um, that, that that's a real challenge. But I would hope that that gets included in curricular, uh, curricula here, whether they're evolutionary curricula, basic biology, um, evolution, because um, I agree with you that it's really compelling, important information. Chris, can you tell us why you decided to become a biologist? Well... I was going to be a fisherman. I think I've told you this story. I was going to be a fisherman. I'm Italian. I grew up in the Bronx, and I was going to be a fisherman. And I, I love fishing, commercial fishing. My relatives all did it. I was going out there. And you know, to line fish where I'm from in New York, you got to follow birds. So I was following birds around, learning about birds all the time, and, um, and loving it. But just about when I graduated from high school, I, I said, I want to be a commercial fisherman. I'm going to stay. I'm not going to go to college. My parents said, well, we have other plans, A. And B, the fishing industry went from line fishing to net fishing. And I don't like net fishing. It's just a different kind of mentality. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. So I went to college. I get to college, and I wanted to be a fisherman. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to, I don't really can't do math very well. You know, I could barely write at that point. Um, so then there was this ornithology class, and I thought, wow, I know a little bit about birds. I've been following those things around for years. So I took this ornithology class and realized that there were all these people out there who were, well, who were basically crafting these stories about the world around us and connecting patterns with the processes that invented them and kind of writing this script or these maps that would enable us to understand how and maybe even why we interact with the world the way we do. And that was incredibly inspiring. The, the other part, which I didn't tell you, is when I was going to fishing and all that, my parents took me to the American Museum of Natural History as a kid. And between that and Wild Kingdom, I was, I thought, wow, if I could do something with animals, that'd be pretty cool. And all I came up with was fishing, but uh, ultimately it turned out to be biology. So you obviously have a strong value around education and also research. I wonder if you could tell us about your most recent trip to Solomon, what you did and what your objectives were. Um, most, mostly my objectives were to visit with these communities and just show them that um, I just feel like what they're doing is, is remarkable. Um, 
and just giving them support just because often there's a lot of animosity toward communities that organize themselves against logging. Um, these logging companies have a lot to lose if communities organize and want to go down a straight and narrow path. So there's actually been physical violence with, in relation to these community conservation agreements. So a lot of it was just standing with people. Um, I went and checked on some of the scholarship programs that we're delivering and met with students. And a wonderful colleague of mine from the Nature Conservancy, Sanjin, who many of you probably know, came over there with me and brought some donors, actually, some um, donors to CNT, board, uh, TNC, board members for TNC, brought them over to the Solomon Islands, and, um, and we gave them a tour of some of our sites to uh, hopefully tempt them, to support them, but also to get their advice on, on how we could kind of craft a fundraising vision to really make these things last into that generational 10 to 20 year time scale. And I did a little bit of bird work too. Um, and we're building a lodge. We're building this research and education center on Kolombangra up at about 400 meters. So I was looking at blueprints and went up and picking out trees, selectively taking these trees that are on this little road up to it to um, carefully cut them down and have them be floorboards. And so all stuff that they don't teach you in graduate school. So he was asking about these seven major groups, and I probably wasn't clear. Like I said, my linear thinking is challenged right now. Um, but uh, there are seven main island groups. This is one of the island groups. And all of those island groups have been heavily influenced by this pressure to liquidate raw natural resources for cash. I mean, just to end on this, I hate to end on a sour note, but it, it is this, this industry, and there are a few people here that, that have dealt with this. Um, this industry is, is, is terrible. Um, there's things like transfer pricing, where there's a big Indonesian company that has all these puppet companies in the Solomon Islands that interact with Solomon Islanders. They cut the trees down, they sell the logs to themselves for about 20% of what they're going to sell them for on the open market, pay royalties on that. Then that gets cut up again. Royalties that go to the villagers are, I mean, sometimes people get $14 for literally, you know, 150 million US dollars worth of timber. This is not cheap timber. So 50, 60,000 hectares of tropical hardwood timber. Think about that the foresters in the room. These are species like Vitex, Calophyllum. Um, they're highly valuable species. And um, so that pressure's huge, and it's a nasty, nasty business. And, uh, and all of these seven main island groups have been influenced by that heavily. The island of Isabel, sadly, in the past eight years, went from 80% coverage in terms of marketable forests to 6% um, in that time period. Um, and that's a big island. It's 140 kilometers long and about 50 kilometers wide. And that's one of the only islands we don't have a community conservation agreement on, really because of that. We were, we were just too late. And we worked there in the forest. We just wrote epitaphs of these incredible forests that we did surveys in. And I sort of had a bruise in my, whatever, brain, heart about that, because we really did. We were too late. Um, and we could, have, we could have captured part of it. There are communities, again, that was one of the places where the guy got really pissed off at me that I didn't think of this earlier. Well, I don't want to keep you guys any longer. Thanks so much.